What we've achieved in nine months is quite incredible. Some of the results we came out with in the local elections in May were incredible. For a party that had about three weeks of leafleting behind us, we came out ahead of long established parties in local elections on our first time out. In the parliamentary by-election we recently stood in, we were the most talked about thing in that by-election. And so scared of us were they that the usual suspects egged on by the opposition uh, and senior figures in the opposition, such as Diane Abbott, whose uh, thugs were there to prevent me speaking, such is, such is the extent of our battle. Uh, but if people step forward, we can do it. If people step forward, we can achieve more and more. Uh, we have got um, incredible obstacles to overcome, and Lewisham, of course, is one of those examples. The media is another one, but they don't have the power they used to have. Uh, so please, do think about it. We've got a really strong message at a really good time. There is an appetite for change. And I think, even if you, I don't think that the uh, big majorities of the 80s and 90s are coming back. I think the big majorities that Thatcher had and the majority that Blair had and the, these big majorities on either side, I don't think they're coming back. And I think the SNP showed it and other, other parties will show it too. I think there's a big change coming and I think that we'll be part of it. And what we've achieved in a short nine months has been incredible. Uh, and, and I want to thank everyone in this room who did everything and everyone watching on film who did that for us. Uh, I wanted to take you through a document, our latest document. We have, as you may know, been sending out leaflets to new branches, and new branches are forming every week. It must be one a week now. I can't really keep up. But new branches are forming all the time, and there's a real enthusiasm building. And this Brexit fiasco is giving us a real boost as well. People are, people are getting on board with the anti-EU message that we're talking about. And we're, we're growing, the enthusiasm is growing, and we can continue to grow. And as I say, uh, we've achieved a lot, but the message, the message is spot on, I think. It's, it's absolutely spot on. Uh, we're not extreme on either end, we're neither left nor right, and we want to be that decent, ordinary majority. And we can. So our leaflets are going out all over the place to new branches. Well, we've come up with a new one which I wanted to take you through, which is our 10-point plan. And have you, have you got that? Would you mind putting that up there? So, withdraw from the European Union without further delay. I think it speaks for itself. And I think we are getting to the time now where the let's walk away option has to be on the table. Or at least the EU should think it's on the table. Is this the best negotiating the British government can do? Yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you, sir which is what it seems to do to the EU, this checkers arrangement is not Brexit. And anyone who wants Brexit knows it's not Brexit. But this is because the EU is calling the shots and Theresa May is putting forward things she knows will, may go down. Well, they won't, of course, because they don't want Brexit to happen at all. But that's the, that's the, the, the grappling. We're doing exactly what the EU wants. And it, it continues to be evident to me that the EU itself is the problem and that we will be stuck wrangling our way out of their clutches for years and years to come. Because the EU itself, the nature of the EU, is the actual problem here. It's a totalitarianism. It, it that sounds an extreme description for it, but at best, at that at objective observation, that's what it is. It doesn't uh, like disobedience. Look what happened. We voted, we dared to vote against the wishes of the EU. They didn't like it. There was no friendly handshake and okay, fair enough. Let's make this as painless as possible. The opposite is true. They wanted to make it as difficult as possible. We have to be seen now by the EU as willing to walk away. And we can, it will survive. This idea of catastrophe is simply not true. We'll survive, we'll more than survive. I think we'll thrive. But at the very least, between now and next March, when whatever happens next March, if anything at all, we must be showing some strength some real strength and understanding that the European Union wants us to stay. There's a reason for that. Start using a bit of leverage, start using a bit of clout and start playing the politics game a little bit smarter and a little bit stronger. Restore, point number two, restore the rule of law and equality before the law. 
This is so vital and every day I see more extreme and ludicrous examples of policing or so-called policing. Again, we have these absurdities about Facebook posts which are deemed offensive while real, real crimes carry on, real, real disgusting crimes, brutal crimes. And the police come out with social, they may as well be social workers, that's what they sound like. You know, they're talking about raising awareness. Again, you had the police this week say that FGM is, is uh, education is the key. This is not their role. They've redefined their role. They're now teaching people political lessons. They're teaching people how to be, what to think, what to believe. People contact me on a regular basis because police have contacted them over something they've put on YouTube. It's the most recent example. Someone from, it was Rotherham Council, would you believe, who contacted this person, asking him why he was putting far-right material on YouTube. And they offered no definition of this, of course, and it'll probably be anything to the right of, of Chairman Mao. Uh, he was visited by the police and asked whether he discussed things like this with his children. Now, we need to understand the enormity of this. The police are going to our doors and asking parents what they are talking to their children about. They are encouraging spying as well, these hate speech laws. This encourages spying. There doesn't even have to be any evidence of any hatred, so somebody thought it was hateful. Some passerby thought it was hateful. And even when they're not crimes, they're recorded as hate incidents. Non-crimes is the Orwellian word used to describe them. We have police recording non-crimes in Britain in 2018. This is serious. And it's serious and it's, it's not going away anytime soon. And it's caused by the common purposing of the police. They have this, this sinister left-wing organization which seeks, which has great power, People like Cressida Dick are graduates from Common Purpose. They have great power, and they seek to completely undermine order. And they're doing so. The police are more concerned with uh, causing offence on Twitter. Or at least, it certainly seems that way. And if it seems that way, then something has to be done about it anyway. But it's certainly true that 900 hate crime officers are occupied in the Metropolitan Police. A Metropolitan Police where murder is, on, is exploding. We have 900 hate crime officers recording non-crime incidents. That's the state of our policing. Equality before the law, completely gone. Completely gone. Now the police will worry about what colour your skin is, what minority group you may come from, which victim group you may come from, and worry about whether taking action against you uh, is, is, is offensive or may inflame community relations. Now they don't seem to realize if we, go, if we apply this to the, the rape gangs, and we can apply it to the rape gangs, they don't seem to realize that it is the rape itself that is causing the community tension. And that the complete lack of response from the police is what causes community tension. But police are concerning themselves with how we vote. They are concerning themselves with what political views we listen to. Uh, they wouldn't allow people in the 80s to be right about the advent of the grooming gangs because they didn't want people to be voting for the BMP. This was what informed their decision whether or not to prosecute child rapists. This is a scandal. We should not be tolerating a police like this. And a police run by people getting a nice chunk of public money for their trouble as well. Uh, number three, end political indoctrination of children in schools. There is, if there's one thing that is most important for the future of this country, it's this. We have to change what children are learning in British schools. We have to change this absurd, uh, in, I, I, I can't even, some of it is almost too unbelievable to, to believe. Uh, we have Islamic indoctrination to the most extraordinary extent where children have, yes, it was, it was taken back, but it still happened. Children were getting a, a racist mark because their parents didn't want them to go to a mosque. And somewhere in, in Stoke, a local council wanted to legislate to disallow parents preventing their children going to mosque visits. So the law was to enforce, was to force parents to ch send their children to a mosque. This is uh, the extreme left open border indoctrination as well. Anything resembling nationality or nationalism or nation state democracy is immoral. And they treat that as if it's a given. Of course it's immoral. Our way is the only way. Everyone else is a monster. 
And that the, the idea that Donald Trump is a monster is a given in schools all over this country. I can't, I have several, several people have told me about teachers making out, re, really strongly anti-Trump remarks, matter of factly. This is the thing, you know, they, they're matter of factly saying there's no debate, there's no discussion. And in fact, one parent has told me that their child was thrown out of the classroom for defending Trump. Now, this is where we are, and we have a National Union of Teachers, which is another extreme left, uh, the, it, it, the entire left wing, you know, the trade unions, all the groups, it's, uh, the public sector, it's all absolutely hijacked now by the extreme left, the communist left. And that's no different. Uh, it's, it's, it's across the board, the National Union of Teachers, I've, I, it, this story always astonishes me, how they get away with it. Having been required by a weak Home Secretary, uh, Theresa May, to teach British values in schools, the National Union of Teachers simply passed a motion at their national conference saying, no, we won't teach British values at school because it's a mark of cultural imperialism and British imperialism and no doubt colonialism and racism and all the rest of it. And they refused to do it. Now, wh where was the response from the government on this? Where is the response on this? It's completely weak. We have to, have to make, get tough, have a response to this. I want children to learn in school how to make a living. I want them to, want to be productive, respectful members of society. I want them to be open-minded. I want them to learn var various different things. I want them to, sort of, to grow as an individual as a result of their education. Not to come out believing that the President of the United States is the devil incarnate and there's only one party I should ever vote for and that's Labour and everyone else is a racist and a fascist. This is what children are being taught in school. In effect, that is what they're being taught in schools. How do we change it? That's a big one. But we have to. We have to put a bit of pride back. We have to start teaching children about the, the culture of this country, the history of this country, the positive history of this country, the massive contribution that this country has made to world history. Uh, and, and the great things about it today, and one of the reasons we're in so much trouble in failing to defend our society is because we stopped believing in it. We stop believing in it because of being educated in it. You can see in the media as well that, that uh, terrible culprit, the media, I blame a large part of our problem on them. Uh, associating the Union Jack, I saw it this week on a dispatches program about Facebook. And when they mentioned hate speech, they showed the Union Jack. They do this all the time. They'll always show uh, the English flags or Union flags, and it will always be to show you how hateful it is. Uh, this is what we have. This is the indoctrination. It's coming from the media, and it's coming from the schools. Uh, sl small things can do it. We can rein in the National Union of Teachers for a start and enforce a curriculum on schools, and if teachers don't want to. We, we, obviously teachers can be creative and teach as they, as they want to. You know, we're not, it's not about reining people in. But people have to have basic knowledge and have to have basic skills. And the schools are to do that and not to indoctrinate. And if teachers don't like it, I'm afraid we'll have to find a teacher who does. Point number four, freeze immigration for five years, deport illegal immigrants. I think this is going to be one of our most popular policies. It is, of course, it, actually the membership is voting on it at the moment. I don't know. I hope people have uh, found their... Okay, thank you. Um, but we will, as part of it, have a freeze immigration for five years. We've got to. It's just... You, it, 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 this is insane. How can you possibly have hundreds of thousands of people coming into your country every year? How can that possibly be sustainable? And the entire political class just pretends it isn't there. They, they talk about problems as if this, this massive, every problem, you know, all the social problems, whether it's, it's housing or crime or the NHS or whatever issue it might be that's affected by numbers. They talk about the increase in demand for these things as if, as if it's not there. We talk about the uh, uh, strain on resources in the NHS over the last decade. They talk about it as if there's no new hundreds of thousands of people in the country in the last few years. They just leave that bit out. And it's always, a bit, you know, policing as well. It's all, the crime levels are going up. No one ever talks about the, the population that's going up. And the population, I'm sorry to say, is not always from the most pleasant of places and are not always bringing the most pleasant of practices with them. Uh, we've, got, we, we've got to get a grip on this. It's, it's simply insanity. And we need to freeze it. 
And again, you know, I, it, it's not about stopping travel in and out of the UK. Because you know you're going to get some smart, smart aleck journalist saying, oh, what are we going to close Heathrow and, and nobody's going to go anywhere. It's not about that. It's about migration. People coming here to live in these large numbers cannot be allowed to continue. There has to be a freeze on it. And whatever resources we currently use for inward migration should be rerouted to looking at illegal immigration. We have over a million illegal immigrants in this country. Uh, most will, will never leave. But what is the impact? That's a lot of people. What is the impact on the ordinary people of this country? It's got to be huge, doesn't it? It's got to be important. So we have to get a grip on this. And I think a freeze is a nice, a freeze for five years is a nice clear message to send to the, to the voter as well. We must stop this stability. It's clear, it's stable, it'll give us a chance to sort out the mess that we're in. But we have to, have to. There's no point in dealing with this. And, and you can't deal with any of the issues brought up by immigration while the borders are still open. You have to bring some sanity and stop it. Uh, point number five, tackle jihadi groups and imprison or remove all who pose a risk to Britain. Um, now, I know that sounds a bit tough and it sounds a bit harsh and there'll probably be a lot of criticism for it. But here's what I don't understand, is if we have 3,000 jihadis in this country who are so well known to the security services that these are the, the we have 23,000 that are watched. Uh, there's a particular focus on 3,000 of those. I want to know who they are. I want to know what it is that makes you put them top of your list and make those 3,000 stand out. I want to know what evidence you've got against them. I want to know what you suspect them of doing. And I want to know also whether they have a right to be in this country. And if they haven't, they should be removed from it. I, we, these, they, are, they are posing enough of a risk to us that they're on the top of a 23,000 person list. So if they're posing that much of a risk to us, why are they here? And I can guarantee you a lot of them won't, have, won't be British citizens, won't have any real legal right to be in this country. And they'll be here because of the Human Rights Act. Uh, because it, human rights is, is used by activist judges, of course, and more left-wing influence in the judiciary as well, uh, to, to, keep, to keep jihadists uh, and real true enemies of Britain in this country. Uh, we, we have to get tough. We have to at least be willing to get tough. And don't think for a minute, because there hasn't been a terror attack for a while, that this has gone away. It absolutely hasn't. And the future is a, a, more of these terror attacks, but more of the insidious, the suit and tie jihad, uh, which we also have to tackle and we also have to be honest about. And what I mean by suit and tie jihad is the uh, Muslim organizations, the Muslim Council of Britain, the Muslim Association of Britain, Groups like this, who have exactly the same aims, which is a Sharia state, uh, as any, any, uh, out, any uh, outward jihadi, bearded jihadi, um, but are going about it in a different way. And I want to confront the ideology itself. I want to confront the ideology of, of jihad, and whether it comes, whether people aspire to, to, it, to impose it on us via a gun or via the ballot box. It's the ideology itself that we must be opposing. And we have to be honest and clear about what, uh, what that ideology is. Imprison or d remove all who pose a risk. I've, I've mentioned removing. Uh, imprison is the part that's going to get us uh, criticised. As in, are we removing due process? I think, it, depending on how bad this thing gets, and as I said, it's not going away, it is going to carry on. We have to be willing even to consider, uh, dare I say the word internment, if these people pose a real risk to us. I wouldn't do it now, but as it goes on, we have to show that we are at least willing to get that tough with people we know pose a real threat to us. That's what I think we have to have going forward as a really, really tough position. Number six, restore free speech and end police prioritization of hate crime. Uh, I've referred to that uh, earlier when I spoke about restoring the rule of law. But this hate crime thing is, is far more dangerous than people realize. These hate speech laws are subjective. And they mean that there's, they're extremely vague, but they're subjective. They have a subjective requirement. And they mean, essentially, that there's no, no evidence at all is required to destroy a person's life, uh, to even throw them in prison. 
this is having the most profound impact on our society. It's having a profound impact on people's confidence to get involved, to speak, to vote how they would like to, to get active how they would like to. And it's above all making people worry very much about losing their jobs. People don't know, and what's, what's so dangerous and insidious about the hate speech laws is that people don't know what they actually mean. And that's not an accident. It could mean anything. So what people's natural reaction is, is to err on the side of caution and say nothing at all. These hate speech laws have created a country that is afraid. It actually is afraid. Afraid is the word. You'll hear people who lower their voice. They'll, lower, they'll whisper. And they do that with me because they know they can say what they like to me about these controversial issues and people do, they whisper it to me. People are afraid. This is a frightened country. And is it any wonder? <coughs> our state is not on our side. The police are not on our side. And these laws are effect, I suspect, designed and in effect have we not losing freedom of speech. It's gone. And what we need is tough, real legislation. I, Again, the members are voting on this at the moment, whether we need a UK constitution or a really tough uh, freedom of speech act which will undo all the mess that has already been caused to our freedom of speech over the last couple of decades. It's an absolute priority. It has to be. Not a democracy without free speech. If a candidate can't speak, then the people can't hear. And they're only left with someone pre-approved by someone. And who that someone is, is anyone's guess. And there's where the problem is. End the UK housing crisis by increasing supply and reducing demand. I, again, I, I refer to this briefly about immigration full stop. But we're constantly hearing how we have a housing crisis. Has anyone looked at the demand crisis? Where is the common sense in all this? We're not building enough, that's true, and there's not enough common sense going into housing either. There are finance initiatives that local authorities could use that are common sense, that save money, that will solve housing problems. But until you turn off the tap, you can't possibly keep up with this. We're still, it brings us back, it brings us back to the big one, the immigration issue, which has fallen off the agenda and we need to put it back on. But housing, how can you possibly how can you possibly add, it's basic mathematics, it's basic common sense. You add 250,000 people to a population, you need to house 250,000 people every year. What's going to happen if there's an undersupply? House prices are going to explode and you have a major problem. And you have people in, you have a, a couple of professionals who can't afford to buy in their hometown. You have people moving uh, from places they, would, they don't want to move from. I mean, it, it, the, it's, it's an absolute, the housing crisis in this country could be brought under control so easily, just so easily, with some decent common sense policies in the, public, in the local authorities and a prioritizing of housing by local authorities and perhaps not so many uh, waste, so much waste in the public sector, which I'll get to. Uh, but we have to get real. We simply have to get real. And in all the time I've been talking about this housing crisis and how demand and supply is basic economics 101, uh, every other candidate I've ever, every other person I've ever debated has never brought it up. I've, I've mentioned this before when I was a candidate, before when I was allowed to be a candidate by UKIP back in 2015. Every candidate on, this, on the stage, whenever at every hostings, uh, was always ignoring, completely ignoring the demand. It always struck me as Orwellian. It really did. Crazy. So let's start telling some truth about it and using some decent... Fi some, there are so many decent finance initiatives that local authorities can use. Some common sense by local authorities, which of course means we have to have competent local authorities uh, and not ones that are there because uh, they feel they have a right to be there. Some of them are entrenched, absolutely entrenched. You see local councils across the country, entrenched, absolutely. Uh, point number eight, end Sharia law in the UK in any and all forms. We've had, uh, some people uh, wonder about the, the, the wisdom of sort of going straight at these issues in this way. And I'd, actually in questions I'd like to hear from you about it. We need to take this on. 
we really need to take this on. Some people believe that you should make it about, for example, religious tribunals generally, or you should make it about integration generally, and talk about the problems of multiculturalism in a, in a sort of general sense, without picking out any individual culture uh, to focus on. This is exactly what we have done for the last 25 to 50 years since we've had these problems and those problems are getting bigger and worse and worse and worse by the year. So let's now do something different. Let's start telling a bit of truth, a few home truths. Let's tell the British public about these issues. What is Sharia law? And then when the British public knows what Sharia law is, make sure they know who wants Sharia law and the fact that they are sitting on mainstream media being interviewed by gushing journalists on a regular basis. These are people who believe in stonings and lashings and beheadings and killing for blasphemy and killing for apostasy and stoning rape victims and yet they're sitting on the BBC chatting away with major BBC presenters while someone like me won't get on the BBC because I'm guilty of hate speech, I'm guilty of hatred towards others. This is the Orwellian madness that we're living in. I want people to understand this. I want people to know what Sharia law is. And I want them to know that there are about 100 Sharia councils operating in this country. And they are operating exactly the same laws that are operated in Iran and in Saudi Arabia and in everywhere else as Sharia family law. I want this confronted. It's the future of our freedom. Islam and Sharia poses an enormous long-term threat to the freedom to the freedoms of people in this country. Your children and grandchildren will suffer under Islam. It's already happening. You can see the dominance in everyday areas of life now. You can see it with halal meat in schools. You can see it with the fact that we're not allowed to cause offence. And if you, if you bring on a death threat by saying something controversial about Islam, you will be the problem. We are already seeing this encroachment on our right to criticise, uh, this, this fear that people have to even talk about this religion. And this capitulation, this repeated over and over capitulation by the public sector, and these the absurd, the absurdities that it produces, like a woman going into a bank with a black cloth over her face. Or as I've seen, I've had that uh, at the airport experience where I've had to take off my shoes and my belt and I saw a woman with a black cloth over her face walk through. Uh, this, is, this is the madness that this sort of dominance, this bullying produces and we ought to stand up to it. And we ought to be very brave and name it and not try to pussyfoot around it by calling it integration. I think also that it's key to our success. This is what will make people trust us because it's very, very difficult to do this. Uh, and people know that if you're going to do something, if you're going to take a risk to tell the truth and something that they know is the truth, they will trust you. And we need to build trust if we're going to succeed. Increase military budget to protect Britain and provide better services for armed forces, personnel and vets. I think that speaks for itself. I think once you sign up to serve your country, your country owes you a duty and a debt and should look after you upon your return. It should be absolutely prioritised in healthcare provision and in housing and helped to adjust back to civilian life and get work and any and all services that people need should be provided. It is the absolute least a, person, a country can do for the people who put their lives on the line for it. I think it should be a top priority and we should be shouting it from the rooftops. And the idea that British, the people who have served Britain are afraid uh, to, or disallowed to walk through the streets in their uniform. People are afraid to wear their uniform. Soldiers are afraid to wear their uniform. I think that's sad. I really think that's sad, and it's a sign of a, fa a society that is seriously failing the people who put their lives on the line for it. And on, on another uh, element of that, we ought to take political correctness out of the army and the defence forces as well, because there is plenty of political, political correctness in those. Okay, finally, ban unstunned slaughter and promote animal welfare policies. This one is really, really popular and it will, it will be really popular. And what I like about this policy is you can't lose with policies like this. No one's going to turn away from you and think, oh no, I, I can't be, be doing with uh, addressing cruelty to animals. But it will attract people which you wouldn't otherwise have attracted. And that's exactly what's happening. We do have people that have come to us over this issue. We have activists who have joined us over this issue. And I don't think it's a minor issue and I don't think it's an unimportant issue. 
it's, uh, there's, it, it, if we can prevent suffering, we should. I think it's a strong moral question. I think that these animals are, uh, we are all better off without these cruel uh, factory farming practices and all these, these other things that we aim to address. We want to go to natural, productive, British, old school farming again. This is what was best for humans and what is best for the animals. And that's what I would like to, like to see us aiming towards, to restore some real farming, some proper, proper British farming. And that's what cows on the, country, on, the, on the scenery where they belong, in, this, in the beautiful British countryside. Okay. I'm going to stop there. I was aware, I was sent some questions which I read through, so I know there's a lot, uh, a lot to get through. But thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, we will, we, we'll get there, we'll get there. I, I'm so, so optimistic. And coming here again, these turnouts, this is a great turnout, and I'm delighted that everywhere I go now we're getting this turnout, and we're getting really enthusiastic people setting up members all the time. It's not going to be easy, and I'm sure we'll get on to a lot more about strategy uh, during the questions. It's not going to be easy, but I do believe in it. I do believe the message is right, uh, and I do believe that if people can see the, the value in the message and come and make it happen, because we have to make it happen. Yeah. It's, it's, it's waiting to see what happens. Uh, <laughs> We'll be waiting a long time. Uh, we have to make it happen. So thanks again for coming out, uh, and uh, yeah, I'll take questions. Thank you. Okay, hi. I'm just wondering, with um, the ship now with uh, UKIP, they're now changing their stance and turn up the demonstrations, as you know. How are we going to counter that? I'm not Does sure. Well, I don't think they are. I'm not sure we need to counter it really. I think we're going. The, the, we're going in a different direction. I think we aspire to something different to what UKIP aspires to. I think it'll certainly do well given the the Brexit fiasco. But the feeling is that it's it's giving a measure of public opinion on Brexit to the Tories. And you, you get the feeling that if the Tories elected a Brexit Prime Minister tomorrow, the, the UKIP vote would collapse again. I think we want to go in another direction. I think we, I, I, I certainly want us to start, in the longer term, my vision for this is to go to Labour, to go to the Labour heartlands. I don't think UKIP, UKIP would have managed really to break through in the Labour heartlands. I think we can. And that's where my long-term vision for this would be. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I suspect Nigel will be back. Uh, and I haven't seen any actual policies from, from UKIP about this. And there is a distinction there. And yes, Jared Batten and I feel very similarly about this. Uh, but I don't see any policies from them. I don't think there are any policies on their website about it. So there's a, you know, immediately there's a big difference. It is a Brexit party. It's just his name turned up on demonstrations. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, um, good timing, yeah. <laughs> good timing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how it works. But, I, you know, if, you can, if, if politicians will change their tune once, they'll change it again and they'll change it again. And, and, and as I said, I suspect Farage will be back soon anyway. And that will again put the clear blue water between us on the Islam issue. Yeah. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, the policies that you have there are all very good, but we seem to have a problem getting the message over to people. And what people here have got to understand is that unless we go out and talk to people and show them the problems that we've got, we're going to get nowhere. We've got two political parties that are so entrenched in getting their soldiers out there and fighting the day. I was at a meeting on Wednesday with the Bruges group, and I made a statement there that was regarding the EU. Japan has just signed a deal with the EU. I saw that, yeah. Money like we do. They have no control from the EU as we do. They have no threats from the EU. And they can allow who the bloody are they like in the country, including no Muslims. And the EU don't say a thing. So why the bloody hell have we got Theresa May spending 40 billion of our money, which she doesn't have, and all the other rigmarole, when Japan can sign a deal with no threats or nothing from the EU? We've got to get the message out there. Folks is there, say everything, Anne-Marie, we've got to do it because this country is heading for disaster and I don't think we're going to get the Brexit we want. I don't think we're going to get Brexit. I don't think there is any... There's, there, uh, 
it, it's happening because there's no appetite for Brexit on either side. Because these politicians, they know, they know the the the, the entrenched, the uh, the authoritarian nature of the EU. They know it's not going anywhere. So it's not going to be, you know, a, a help Brexit. It's going to make it as difficult as possible, largely to show the rest of Europe what to send the rest of Europe a lesson. Uh, don't bear, don't uh, disobey us. Why? I agree with every word you've said. I also share your anger. It's, it's, they can make, I know, they can do, they can make, uh, it's, you see it all the time. You see it with the international bodies as well. Other countries don't take masses of refugees. Uh, nothing is said. We, Trump says it's that build a wall. It's the UN sticks its nose in. It's, it's always the same. We're always expected to take, to have these open borders, to take orders from these international bodies. Only us in the West, only us in the West. Why a million reasons? A million reasons. I'm sure you'll have your own views on them. Just following off what the chap said there about getting the message out, <clears throat> I was a Labour voter for like until about three years ago, and all my friends, especially on Facebook, are all Labour. <coughs> if I mention one word about anything to do with anything you've talked about, I get so much abuse back. But if they heard you talk now, to a lot of your policies to get them to come back, I think they might actually agree. A, it seems there's a lot of, not resentment, but to admit they're wrong, but they've been dragged along for so long in this direction. And as Alex here, and my friend Matt, we've come down because we were believing all that, but it takes a lot of guts to actually go against people you've known for years to say things because you're going to get called racist, white supremacist, and all that. So if we can get people to come down and listen to you, you know. Please do. And, but there's got to be a, a way to do that, like a, a format to get them to come down. And if everybody here told three or four people in, a, in the right way and swell these numbers to the back of the hall, that's the way to do it, I think. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it several times. But we need to do, we need to do all of these things. We need to do everything. We need to do so many different things, but tried and tested things, things that you do. Uh, you get on the internet, you make videos, they are spread. I mean, it's, we get, I've got thousands more of the YouTube videos, viewers now, than I had when we started. You know, and it's, it's working, it's developing, it's growing. Uh, we need to use every, every, every possibility, every communication we can. Leaflets, events, internet, good old fashioned campaigning and doorstepping. We need to use it all, but it won't be easy. But I still think we're doing incredibly well. Hi. I'm picking up what that gentleman said. There's, um, I've come to the conclusion that there's a lot of people that will go out with a placard, and there are other people that don't want to do such a thing so publicly. Uh, if you search YouTube, and you'll also see in a minute, there's a video called Be a Snail, Leave a Trail. And what you can do, you were saying about talking to individual people, mm. what you can do is be a snail, leave a trail for other people to find. Mm. And you are absolutely right. If people speak to just one or two people every single day, so it becomes a habit, or they leave a leaflet where they go, over a course of a year, if you multiply that up, you can reach the whole of the UK. Mm. And you're certainly navigating the media as well, which are on our side at the moment. So I think being a snail in the trail is the way, and also for people that are entrenched in their beliefs, as we all were at one point, um, if we can give them a slowly but surely graceful exit from their entrenchment so that they can formulate their own opinion, and it's usually, there's a saying that you can't say the wrong thing to the right person, and I think that they will eventually start putting the pieces together and decide that actually I don't like what they're doing, but I do like what they're doing. People stay silent, don't they? That's the yeah. easiest way. I think though, what you've got to do is just to have the courage to say what you think and uh, pay no attention to what other people say. Yes. Uh, our uh, forefathers yes. placed machine guns in the trenches and fought for the freedom of this country in a very physical way where they could be uh, mortally wounded or even killed. Or the worst thing that's going to happen to us is that somebody's going to call us a racist and we've just got to say, so what? Some people have lost their jobs, right? 
That is the big one. That is the big one. People losing their jobs is the big one. If everybody started speaking out, there'd be so many people, they wouldn't be able to sack the people that say what we say. They wouldn't be able to put us in prison because there'd be so many, there wouldn't be the space in prisons. So it just requires everybody to have the courage to speak out. That is true. That is true. It's just, it's extremely difficult for individuals. Everybody's fearful now of the police, of, as you say, hate crimes. Nobody wants to stand up and, and speak their mind because if they do, they get labelled. Mm -hmm. You know, racist, homophobic, sexist, bigot. And as so soon, soon as you open your mouth, I know. I know. people are terrified. Mouth, you shot down flames. Yeah, this is people why are terrified. The state's punish is exactly like you. You've got to fight them, you've got to stand up against them. Don't you think you think if they're here at a meeting, shouting down, saying, excuse me, this is called democracy. If you don't like it, go out. You're not welcome here. We're here to listen to the reasons of why we're here for. You've got to fight them back, because this is in our society. Unless we fight, we lose. And if we give up, we might as well just give up and get up the ghost and let me, let me run by here, you and, and certainly the Muslims. Well, so, so, yeah, it's not worth it. Look, like political leaders, church leaders are bowing down, they're ordering people to bow down. They're, they're using, the Pope has called for uh, more immigration. It's, yeah, it's across the board. And, and, the, and the, left, the lefties wouldn't do, the people that the Archbishop of Canterbury has invited here, if the left, if any Christian said or thought anything remotely like those did, let they want to kill gays and all the rest of it, if that was a Christian, the left would be pro, there'd be riots. And do you know something else, and that people aren't really aware of, is that the, 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 the British government fund religious organisations that have every pound donated is, is supplemented by the government and it's their way of controlling <coughs> this organisation. Well, they're not doing a very good job of it. It's their organisations. They're, they're raking in millions through British government, uh, British taxpayers' money, to fund their, to fund their, their situations. Yes. God knows where else they get the money from, from Saudi yes. Arabia and the rest of it. Well, we're, we're very much we paying for our own destruction on many, on many accounts. Uh, the man in the white shirt. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah, yeah, Hello. Uh, I've come down from Sheffield. Uh, this is Three things, two of them are fairly well connected here. Yeah, right, can we have one conversation in the room, please? Um, we, as parents, have got a duty to our children to protect them. These Great. grooming gangs, yes, they're portrayed as men, Muslims, they're not, they're Islamists. And it's not just them, it goes further ahead. They're emboldened by inactivity within the powers of the and they're also within the system, it's corrupt to the core, with paedophiles and what that is the party stands on fishing all of its out. The ho I agree with you entirely. I want the people, I want the disgusted local people in towns where this happens to have the legal ability to remove these chief constables who have sat around and chief executives of councils who sat around for decades and did absolutely nothing. I want them fired at best, criminally prosecuted, uh, uh, preferably. This is a scandal. Of course it happened because of, of this, this corruption across the board in the public sector, in the police and local government. Of course it happened. They, would have, they could have stopped it. They should have stopped it. They didn't. They are to blame for that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about the fact that 84% of these are Muslims. And that it's, there's, there's a common factor here. And that if we can learn that lesson, perhaps there's a lesson in immigration to be learned from that. Uh, we have to understand that a lot of these people, this culture is coming from a place where girls are not covered, are considered to be fair game. Then you're putting these people into a society where girls are not covered. That's relevant and we should be talking about it. And no one said uh, only Muslims rape children, but there's a problem here. And there's a problem with the way they see us, there's a racial problem, there's a problem. We, and we should, and it's big enough for us to be talking about it and confront it with, uh, and covering all aspects. And that one's important and we can't run away from it. Uh, okay, I'll come to you. I, yeah. Hi, hi, I know you're right. Um, some, something that bothers me about, um, um, specifically about the Islam at the moment is the... Speak up, what, Yeah, sorry. It's something that bothers me at the moment about Islam, we haven't specifically mentioned it tonight, is the wearing of the full-face burqa, um, which I think is a, a big barrier to social integration, um, and for society in general, 
Um, I don't think it does any good for the people, the Muslim women who are in this country, in terms of what, employment prospects or you know, communicating with the native people of the country, integrating, etc. Um, and you know, and also to the big security threat around that. I think we need to go further than just advocating a you know a ban in public spaces. But should it? Do we need to consider an outright ban for something that just is um, uh, sort of represents a different value system to uh, our own country? And sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, is a visual sign of the segregation that exists between, you know, Islam and British society. I agree. Uh, it is a, a very, dis it's a sinister, disturbing yeah. thing, the burqa and the niqab. I don't, it's, it's, make, it's very uncomfortable for a culture like us to be confronted with this. It has to be banned. How you would ban it, you know, banning it in public spaces is pretty much banning it because you can't uh, tell people that they can't wear it at home, and if they wear it at home, it's got no impact on the rest of us anyway. Um, but the, one of the big elements, big questions, I think, that needs to be answered is about schools, whether it should be banned in schools. I think if you ban it in public spaces, you're banning it in schools, but if you're, what about private schools? Uh, and what about the hijab in schools? I personally, I, it's not something I necessarily advocate. I do advocate banning the book or banning the face veil, absolutely. Uh, but whether I would advocate banning the hijab, personally I'd like to see it banned in schools. But I think it might be just a little bit too far, a little bit too authoritarian. Maybe you could put an age on it. But it is, it's, it's, and I don't think most of the girls want to wear it. They don't, you know, we're told about this choice stuff. I, I'm sure, of course, some women choose to wear it, but I'd wear it to the, the vast majority don't. And if they had any bit of freedom, they wouldn't. I remember doing a school in Harrow, talking this a long time ago, back when I was still allowed to speak at schools. Uh, I, I, there was a, girl, a, a room and uh, lots and lots of girls had the hijab on in the room. And when I said we should ban the burqa, they applauded. And I know it's different, the burqa and the hijab are different, but it gives you an idea that they're not big fans of this Islamic garb if they're going to applaud the idea of banning the burqa. It, we must it, it, ban it outright in public. This is, it's, 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 uh, it's absurd. It's absurd. It actually looks like something, someone from a science fiction. You just can't believe that you have all these exceptions and that someone is allowed to walk around in airports with a long black cloth over their face. It's crazy. It absolutely has to be banned. And I think there's a, a debate for banning the hijab in schools, and I personally would be in favour of it. I, I think it goes deeper than that. I think, it, you know, I think for society in general, they just... Uh, you mean for the future? It, you, know, ma you know, it magnifies the, the divide, doesn't it? it you know. It's just a, perhaps a wee so bit too authoritarian. Yeah. I think you have to get that balance between liberty. Uh, you know, you have to. You can't go too far into encroaching on people's liberties, uh, even if you think it would be for the best. I think you have to be very careful. Maybe in the longer term, uh, the future culture of the country to ban it altogether would be an idea. That would be the thing that would persuade me most. But it's just. I don't think the public would go for it, but banning this, the niqab, definitely. I think it, it already has majority support, yeah. and we should go with that. I, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, advocate banning the, the hijab, but the, the full face banning. Yeah, oh, definitely, is, definitely, without doubt. Just shouldn't be there. Without doubt, without doubt. I'm... Okay, Hi. I'll stand up because I've got a quiet voice. Um, I wanted to come back on the paedophilia uh, and the so-called grooming gangs. Um, and I, I think rape gangs would be more appropriate. But I think it's it's very, very serious. And I don't want to wonder what for Britain what we can do to help because I had a friend commit suicide because she wasn't able to protect her two children. And she really enlightened me because I kept saying, can't you do this, can't you do that? And they're called rings for a reason. That I, she couldn't get help at the school because there was a teacher was in the paedophile ring. Really. She couldn't get help with a CID because her main perpetrator, i.e. her husband, he had his father in the CID. And um, the social workers have been told she's a liar, even though she had proof that he was lost. And so no one helped these children. And, and it just came to me that it's just, they've got people, it's not that we swamp them, but they've got people in such high places, in the royal family, in the governments, in everywhere. And the Islamic people beings are certain, certain prolific. I won't go to an Islamic country because they just grab them. You know, but what can we do? Because it's, it's 
it's, it's very, very serious and, and we need to protect our children, you know. I mean, at a political level, we need a complete culture shift in policing and social welfare. Yeah. There needs to be, there needs to be, I guess on a more practical level, something fundamentally safe for whistleblowers to go to. And for someone to be there for the whistleblower. Being a whistleblower is a dangerous business, and we rely on them. And we saw what happened to whistleblowers in Rotherham and elsewhere. It, it's, it's a huge question. I think we could do practical things on the ground. I think we could set up support groups, phone yeah. lines. Uh, there, I, a friend of mine is doing something just like at the moment in Scotland for grooming gang victims. There is no specific helpline to gather information. You hear a lot of anecdotal evidence that this is going on, but there's nowhere seems to be anywhere, anyone gathering information, anything concrete. As you say, girls are meeting a brick wall everywhere. On a practical level, we need to fill that, we need to fill that, that hole that they're just facing, that there's no support there. We have to fill that gap. But there are a million. No. What do you think we should do, locally? Well, they, they need to do something about the social, the corruption with the social workers and the police force, all colluding, and everyone's wanting to protect their jobs. Well, let's campaign to make them accountable. One of the big problems, again, is lack of accountability. They're not answering to anyone. These, these police, these senior police and senior chief executives are not answering to anybody. They're answering to each other. Basically, another layer of bureaucracy and then another layer of bureaucracy until they're moved from one bureaucratic job to another bureaucratic job on another six figures. They're all accountable to each other. I think we've got to work out a way to make them publicly accountable. Something with real teeth. Going on years and yeah. years and years. That's it's entrenched. It's entrenched. Could I say something? But, yeah. I was a victim myself at the age of eight. I'm 58. It's been going on for 50 years a court case. Your court and case. You know what I get is no evidence. I was a new owner of my wife's paper. It's been going for 50 years to bring him to court. He went to court once when I was 12 years old. So on a Saturday, my name got published in a well-known newspaper. Do you know why he got let off? Because he was getting married the same day. The police are still, they're now coming back on the scene. They've reopened up the case. And now I've been told is there still may not be the case to pass. And I have to live with this for 58 from the age of 8 to the age of 12. I was in a house for a period of time. Yes, there's many times I went to commit suicide. In blood took what, two years ago? And you're not a statistic, are you? This is it. We talk about these things as if they're statistics. I did want to. Something. Failure after failure after failure. So disrespectful. It's incredible. It's incredible. The other things I say they should stop handing out those soft sentences. Yeah. They they're, 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 they're getting like eight year sentences. Which is nothing. And they're because out I live with it. I've got yeah. to live with it. So Whereas what they do to the children is a death sentence. It is sort of like living dead, you know. And then they get eight years and then they let them out after a year anyway. Sentences are shocking. Uh, people will argue that there's not enough prison places. We'll build some. Sorry, it's a priority. They should get life, and it shouldn't mean life. Yeah. Right? They shouldn't have TVs in their rooms, radios, and all sorts. I'm sorry. They took away my life, and yet they can have birthday cars and everything else. You know? So why it's... should they live in the life of natural when I'm living in hell? It's injustice. It's injustice, and we're here to fight against it. That's all we can do. It's all we can do. I, I wish you well. I'm sorry for the. It's, it, it's, 
But you, you remind us all, and you've reminded me that this isn't, we talk about figures all the time, but real people are really suffering. And our leaders and our, the people who are supposed to protect us don't, say, don't give a damn. It's not really because we sort of like want to shut it in the cupboards and so But we're here to fight you. We're here to fight them. Um, I want to uh, know your policies or your views uh, on homelessness. Um, we've got quite a bit of homelessness in, in Norwich, maybe not as much as other cities. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite disgusting really to see in the 21st century homeless people living on the streets and dying on the streets when you have immigrants coming in and I think there's going to be another 100 or is it 200 coming into Norwich Syria. Yeah, from Syria allegedly yeah. that are going to go straight into accommodation. Yeah. And the other, the other thing is, I mean, I'm an ex-serviceman, allegedly there are over 9,000 ex-servicemen living on the streets of the UK with no help, yeah. uh, with mental issues. I'd just like to know what your, what your views are on it and your <laughs> policies, if any, please. Well, the uh, people, the veterans, as I've, I've said uh, when I was going through the leaflet, absolutely have to be prioritised for housing and for health. It's the least a country can do. We have to, it's, it's common sense again, we have to stop all this migration as a starting point. You have to turn off the tap and then you have to elect local governments because the local governments are actually very powerful. They, you know, they govern a lot of very important matters and of course housing is one of them. We've got to get some competent, uh, competent local government who know that they have to build houses for local people uh, and be made to do it. And let's have some incentivised, let's have some decent economic policies, some decent economic ideas to get this thing moving. But you have to, at first, close the door. You cannot possibly have a decent housing strategy unless you have... And you, with hundreds of thousands of people coming into the country and a local council might be left with a thousand people suddenly to cater for. You cannot have a housing policy if you have a thousand people turning up on your doorstep. That's what has to stop. And then we have to start holding these incompetent local governments to account and get some building going and get some house prices down a little bit, I think, in some areas at least. What would your stance be on proposal representation how it could um, help the party grow because as much as as much as these policies make it good for um, for working class people and just general people in the country, surely you're just banging up against the brick wall which is first past the post. For example, in 2015, you could got just under four million votes. Under a PR system, that would work out that they'd get 83 seats when in reality they only got one. So how do you think that it could be? Uh, that PR could be campaigning for as a main party policy, yes. Even if you do get more support, the MPs may still not come because it could be spread out and you get close to majority, but it still doesn't matter. I think it's, it's one of the things that members are voting on at the moment, whether we should campaign for a proportional representation. I expect the vote to be yes, and I think it's very important. Uh, we, how we campaign for it is to continually point out the injustice that that description, that example you've just given describes. People need to know this. This is not. It, it produces, and it has produced and will continue to produce uh, a two-party state, at least for the foreseeable future. But, on the other hand, first past the post, I have a lot of sympathy with first past the post. Firstly, because it produces strong government a government that can have a majority in Parliament and doesn't have to go away. Proportional representation presents a lot of cooperation. Uh, and I like the, quite the, the strength of the first part, the very notion of first past the post. Uh, it's very clear. But I think the country is ready for proportional representation. I think first past the post is no longer fit for purpose. But I will make one last point. Uh, the Scottish National Party in 2015, now I know that UKIP had close to 4 million as you said and only got one MP. The Scottish National Party managed to wipe Labour off the face of Scotland in one night. I didn't expect them at all to get rid of so many Labour MPs in one night. It was a complete wipeout and that was on the first pass of post. So I think if things, you know, no system can prevent you from winning if your policies are good enough and if you're getting out there uh, and, and getting your message out. But 
on balance, I have sympathy with both arguments, but on, on balance, I think probably proportional representation is where it's at and we're going to, and I think that's what the party's going to vote for, and I'll happily campaign for it by pointing think, out just these injustices. Sorry, do you think for Britain could be the one national party that actually keeps banging on and on about that? Because none of the other parties are. They'll have the Greens, Sympathetic, the Lib Dems, even Labour. You Absolutely. The Norwich South MP, Clive Lewis, talk about it. Uh, the SNP are in favour of it. Oh. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If that's how the members vote, then absolutely. It's one that will be uh, one of our many unique policies. And we need to target um, predominantly Brexit areas where they have been let down by their MP, where they voted against what constituents. Yeah, I think we do. I think Especially we need to be wise. The East Midlands, it was predominantly. Really yeah. These are, these are questions that are really going to be answered over the next few months, depending on well, when, we've no idea when we'll have a general election. Uh, I don't think there's going to be one this year, but I seem to be in a minority. Most people think there's going to be one in the autumn. I don't think there will be. Um, but we don't know when it's coming. I'm asking people to prepare to, if you, to leave here this evening and seriously consider standing as a candidate. Please do. Uh, it will depend a lot on how many candidates we get. We would like to let everyone stand, for everyone who wants to stand, to stand. But their obvious common sense should tell you that there are areas that we should, we would be more likely to do well. I think the uh, Yorkshire and Lancashire and the northeast of England are areas that we could do very well initially. Uh, and we've already got quite a lot of activity, a lot of branches up in the northeast of England. And it's not, it's not about giving up on the rest of the country. It's about going where you can have an impact and where you can build support. Yeah. So definitely, I mean, we, these are things that we need to iron out when we see how many candidates we get. But definitely targeting is, is wise, especially at this early stage where we need a little bit of momentum, a bit of attention. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two quick things. Uh, you brought up a great point there. I keep seeing it on Twitter about um, standing as a candidate or um, as a councillor. Uh, I don't know, unless you've got a, a, a background in politics, I have no idea what that's involving. <laughs> I know I have no idea what I would have to do. I have no idea how much time and effort it would take. Okay. So I think a bit of um, direction from Fort Britain would help to clarify and crystallise that and uh, get people to take the, take the plunge. Um, on the second thing, I don't know if you all noticed in this room, but when we started talking, there's a lot of how do we get people to do, and then when we st started talking about um, um, what you could do, be a snail, leave a trail, writing to the um, uh, superstores, uh, standing up, don't give a damn, don't care if you're being called racist because you're not your petrolatic patriotic. Um, it, what it shows is we're all at different levels and I think the way forward, and shoot me down if I'm wrong, is when you get up in the morning, and this is how we get to that living there, we get the masses behind us, is to get up in the morning and say, who can I communicate the full Britain message to today and how? Now if you want to run down the street with a placard, good on you. If you want to leave a leaflet at a cash point, good on you. But that's the way we do it. Every day, be a snail, leave a trail, get out there, get it in front of people, and get them thinking about it, and then that will <coughs> snowball and will get momentum. Social I media. love this, thank you. Social media, it doesn't matter where you are. If, um, I'll tell you a nice one. Yeah, social media, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're comfortable at doing, that's where I think you should pitch it. And if you're at work, sorry, Anne, if you're at work and you know you're going to get it in the neck by um, voicing, well, serotipation, serotipation, I can't say it myself now. On the notice board, on the quiet, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and, and then you can leave one at the coffee machine. Um, and it doesn't have to be a fancy poster, it just has to be, oh, I bought a stamp, which cost me seven quid. Every time I go to Sainsbury's, they've got free newspapers. By the time I leave, that newspaper is full of all Britain. <laughs> that site. <laughs> you know, hundreds of people are going to come in and read that newspaper and think, Wow. Oh, we so, love this. Thank you. I love the idea of people getting up in the morning and thinking, how can I promote for Britain today? I love this. Thank you. Um, I have, just to come back to your first point, I have contacted branches to ask them to organise a meeting 
with the sole intention of selecting or at least identifying candidates at those meetings we want to tell people exactly what to do and, and ideas about what to, how to get involved in your local area to raise your profile and then we will have media training for candidates um, so I'm hoping that some more branches will will organize those also, meetings there's a few in the pipeline on YouTube so people that normal people normal good idea can look I'll get that go, oh I can do that <coughs> I'll, I'll get that done. Yeah. I run um, Boot Levy Standard Facebook group. And some of the best things what we share is Anne Marie, a picture of Anne Marie and Cruz. And they sh share all day long. And that's what you need to do. Yeah, yeah. Simple quotes and pictures travel more than anything. We were thinking about t-shirts and quotes as well. There is merchandise coming, by the way. These things are IT very difficult. Um, okay, anyone else? Okay. Changing tact, um, there's been a few cases recently of kangaroo and secret courts of whistleblowers to mm. the elite in this country. I was wondering what your views are on the, the cases of Tommy Robinson and Melanie Shaw and the legality involved, because surely it's <coughs> touching on the borders of whether it's legal or not. You know, honestly? I really don't know enough about the legal details of these cases. I mean, there's this camera on me, and what I say, uh, it will be used to get, if I say anything, I really don't know the details of them, and they're very, very complex. And what I will say is that it's, it is persecution. They, it is constant, he has 10 years plus of persecution, and everybody knows it. And regardless of what the legalities of are the case against him, everybody knows that. The police, the selective policing, the selective law enforcement, of course, of course, if he, was, if he wasn't Tommy Robinson, he would be treated very, very differently. But I don't know the cases to comment on them on camera or any other way. going to blow the whistle. In fact, she started to blow the whistle on many high-level MPs, police chiefs, councillors. And suddenly, she's put in solitary for two years. And now they're claiming that she's gone skew with. When she's been in solitary for two years, they're not allowed to be in for more than three months. So they've basically turned her. They've put Tommy in solitary for longer than is legally allowed in the past as well. Corruption, it's endemic. It's absolutely endemic. We, do, we all have to do our bits, and what we're trying to do as a party here is to provide that political pushback. Uh, you know, there are, there are lawyers working for Tommy, there are activists working for Tommy. Everyone has to do their bit. And we are, what I want us to do is provide that political party for people to vote for. And even if we start out small, which of course, actually we didn't start out small, we did really well in the local elections. But we, just to be that someone, that they can go out and they're, they're too afraid to say so, but they can vote in private. And that's our job, is to provide that part of the fight back. Um, but I, I, of course, he needs to be kept safe. It's, <laughs> poor Tommy. The, the man has just been persecuted for years. I don't know how he does it, actually. I don't know how he puts up with it. I don't know how he keeps going. Okay, I think, well, what time are we on? <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll come back to you. Okay, um, this should be the last one. about the corruption within the police. Should police officers be allowed to serve with a criminal record? God, that's, that's not a question I've considered. My instinct would be no. Because there's apparently there's at least 5,000 currency serving. Really? I had no idea that was and the case. Just going to what the gentleman was saying about the veterans, surely you maybe giving them a job within the police force, keep these. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they deserve it more than absolutely. And I was speaking to my the security guys who look after me at outdoor events, they're all ex Marines and they're not welcome in the police. They're, they're, too, they're too tough, basically, for the police. They're exactly what the police need, but the police don't want them because they're too tough. They want blue nail varnish. They want high heels and blue, na blue nail varnish. That's who gets into the police now. They don't want ex-military. They don't want exactly what we need. And there's an active campaign to keep them out. They don't want them. The police don't want them. Well, I agree. Let's start putting the veterans into the police. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and people might actually be afraid of them. Yes, that's what we need. Because you can't, if you have these 
you have the most brutal organized criminal gangs from Eastern Europe and we have a police that has high heels and nail varnish on Twitter and that's the men you know this is a, we can't no one's going to be afraid of that but no policeman or policewoman should be prancing around in the streets with flags and tassels and this is not policing and they're not social workers either and they shouldn't be raising awareness of anything they should be prosecuting people for breaking the law how about that i think we'll end on that okay okay I will end on that, but we'll be around to have a chat. Thank you all once again for coming along uh, and for joining and for supporting. And onwards we go. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.